18-year-old Christopher Cassanetti's huge smile perfectly matched his spirit of generosity and love of life. They were qualities he clearly inherited from his mum and dad, Patricia and Rob. Six weeks ago, Christopher happily headed off to his job as an apprentice on a building site in Sydney. But by lunchtime, he was dead, pinned under 17 metres of twisted metal scaffolding that had collapsed on him and a workmate. Patricia and Rob will never be able to comprehend the loss of their beautiful son, but being the decent people they are, they feel compelled to talk about it. More so, they're now campaigning to save anyone else from the anguish they'll suffer the rest of their lives. This building site at Macquarie Park, Sydney, emptied of its workers with its machines sitting idle, is a desolate and haunting place. It's where, last month, 18-year-old Christopher Cassaniti was killed, crushed beneath 17 metres of falling scaffolding. It has now been cleared away for investigation. Christopher's death in this place has sparked outrage and demands for new industrial manslaughter laws. I'm taking a stand for Christopher and I'm here to help change the rules. A campaign led by his distraught and angry parents, Patricia and Rob Cassaniti. My anger is, is why him, why, how? But you wouldn't, want, well, you wouldn't want to wish it upon anyone no, but, anyway. You know, but, you know. It was such a big um, building construction corporation. How does this happen? It will come out in the investigation. But you want to know now, Rob? I want to know why my son died. Yeah. This is America. Christopher was the middle child of three beloved sons. Six weeks since his death, as well as anger, his family is suffering overwhelming grief. I think my worst time is when I hit the pillow. It, you start getting the visions of, you know, the day unfolding of how it all happened. And What's the most dominant vision for you? When I had to identify him. I'm just looking at him thinking it can't be, you know, you're looking for signs of life and you can't. And that, that's hard. That's really hard. It was like a big load off my shoulders after I saw him. I thought, you know what, he's... He still looked beautiful. Like, he still know. looked the same. He still looked beautiful. I was... He was content. Like, he even had a little smile on his face. But, you know, as a parent, you don't want that. You don't no. want to see that. But unfortunately, we had to. Yeah. It was the toughest thing I've, I've ever done. Darren Greenfield, the New South Wales State Secretary of the CFMEU, was on site within five minutes of the tragic collapse. It's deafening. It, it's like everything stops when something like this happens and it's just, there's dust everywhere. It's like a war zone. And that's, that's what it was like in there when this happened. Trapped under this mangled metal lay young Christopher and his colleague, 39-year-old Khaled Webby, both still alive. The instructions there, let's do something. And for the next 20 minutes, both yelling out to those above. What did they hear Christopher say? Just asking for help. Asking for help, asking for his mum. It's very hard, very hard. An 18-year-old boy. I mean, you see grown men crying, and you just think, not again, not another one. Not another person, not going home that night. In this catastrophe, it would be Christopher who never made it home. Khaled, though terribly injured, lying just a metre from Christopher and holding his hand until the end, would survive.
Very contagious smile. He does. Mm. He had a huge smile and everyone, everyone picked up on it. That uh, smile back. The Cassanidi family is proudly close. Thank you, Mum and Dad. It's been a good 18 years. Has it? Yeah. It's been a good 18 years. What do they call them? Famous last words. Famous last words. For the past 18 months, Christopher and his mother even worked together. Patricia manning the coffee van on the building site, while Christopher thrived as an apprentice form worker. I think the first um, week, Christopher came to the um, the van and he had a sandwich and a drink in his hand in his hand and his shoelaces were undone and um i said your shoelaces are undone i said that's really unsafe so i bent down and started doing his shoelaces and his boss literally walked up to the van to get his coffee and he looked to the side and he goes patricia he goes what are you doing and i said well i'm doing his shoelaces he goes we're on a job site, Patricia. And I said, your son is being watched by so many people here. And I said, and I was like, oh my goodness. So, and he didn't care. That is such a mum thing to yeah, do. He just didn't care. Good morning, thank you. 5 a.m., April 1st. 1st just four days after his 18th birthday, and Christopher drives his brand new car to work. Mum plans a rare day at home. Emergency crews are responding to scaffolding that's collapsed on a... Around midday, line. news of an accident at the site hits the headlines. Fire rescue crews are also on scene. So kind of panic just set in and just dropped everything. And as I'm getting close to the job site, <clears throat> I couldn't breathe. I'm alone in the car and I'm screaming. As Patricia approaches the Macquarie Park site, her agony intensifies. He said it believes two men are trapped under scaffolding that collapsed. It's also believed some rubble. She is now told Christopher is in the rubble, but no one can tell her his condition. Until she gets the news, no parent wants to hear. That's when I saw the policeman come up to me and he knelt in front of me and he his words, which I can't get out of my head, were, Mrs. Cassanidi, unfortunately, we couldn't do anything for your son. Um, and he has passed away. And those words just keep ringing in my head constantly. And I was in total denial. I just screamed because I thought, it, it's not possible. You know, it's not possible that he has died. So when Rob walked through the door. He saw my face and he says, what's wrong? And I just said, he has, didn't make it. And then he started. How did your son die? Did they tell you that? Um, his lungs were crushed and he died of asphyxiation. So he wasn't able to breathe. So when I asked the coroner, I said to him, I said to him, I said, did he suffer? And they said, apparently he would have had so much adrenaline that he may have felt some pain, but because he wasn't able to breathe, um, he would have gone in and out of consciousness. Coming up, the leaked emails that warned of a tragedy. There have been reports that three safety officers resigned through this job. We did no. not know that at all and a family fighting for justice. What do you think should happen to whoever is deemed responsible for the death of your son? They should feel the same pain we're feeling. Make them hurt. That's next on 60 Minutes. As tragic as the scaffolding collapse at this worksite was, the death of 18-year-old Christopher Cassaniti and the serious injury of Haled Webby, according to union rep Darren Greenfield, it could easily have been so much worse. They actually worked through lunch to finish some work off. If it wasn't lunchtime, we'd have probably 32 workers under that scaffold. 32 yep. dead men? Yes, yes. 
what or who caused the scaffolding to collapse so catastrophically is now under investigation. But complaints about the safety of this site had been raised more than a year before this terrible incident. We've obtained numerous emails written by the scaffolding company to the construction company, Janellen. Disturbingly and repeatedly, those emails point to safety breaches after the scaffolding was set up and warn people could die as a result. Midway through last year, Janellen received this chilling forewarning after the scaffolding was thought to be tampered with and deemed to be unsafe. We do not want something happening because of removed components and someone not going home to their families. In the other emails and as photos taken on site show, the complaints relate to the overloading of the scaffolds with building materials and the premature removal of ties which secure the scaffolding to the apartment block. Despite the vast number of complaints, the safety breaches continued. Darren believes breaches like these most often occur because of the growing pressure yeah, to save time and money. money. And people shouldn't die because of money. There's no excuse for a worker on a construction site to pass away over money and a program. If something takes a little bit longer to build, so be it. There have been reports that three safety officers resigned through this job. Why did they leave? Normally, they don't get listened to, so they move on and they try and go somewhere else. No. Did you know anything about them mm. and why they left? No. No. We never That's told the first that. I've heard of it, actually. I'd like to speak to those three safety officers that quit. We didn't. We no. did not know about it at all. I'm sure they've got something. The construction company Janellen refused our request for an interview. It's likely to take years for investigators to resolve why Christopher died. That's too long for many workers in the construction industry who are demanding uniform industrial manslaughter laws which could see their bosses go to jail. And I promise you to continue until it's done because Christopher and all the others that have died on job site will not have died in vain. It's just, you know, it's going to be a law. You know, I'm going to call it Christopher's Law. What do you think should happen to whoever is deemed responsible for the death of your son? I know it's... I know I've, I've got a life sentence. I have a life sentence. They should feel the same pain we should, we're feeling. Make them hurt. How? I, I, jail term, something. Make them, make them understand that their decision has cost someone's life, our, our boy's life. If Patricia and Rob can find any comfort, it's knowing their beautiful son believed he was leading a beautiful life. He had everything. Yeah. Everything he wanted, you know, car, job, family, maybe the girlfriend issue could have been <laughs> a different thing. Poor but guy. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's ever kissed a girl. I don't think he's ever, ever kissed a girl. He's so shy. Yeah. So, so shy. But he was a happy boy. Yeah. He was a happy boy that time. Now the milestones are much sadder, today being particularly poignant. First Mother's Day. Um, Without Christopher. I keep thinking of that. It's not just this Mother's Day, it's every Mother's Day. Although I have my beautiful boys, you know what I mean? It's that little hole. That's a bit empty. It's a little bit empty. To help heal, this weekend the family has retreated to Christopher's favourite spot on the Hawkesbury to reflect and relive their most special times with their boy. So when you go there now, what, what is it that you feel? I feel he's there. Mm. I feel he's there. The hardest part for me is when, you know, I've got the boat moving but there's no one on the back, you know, and I look behind and... That was all him. That, yeah. was, that was his niche. He loved it. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. 
Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.